sweater, nice shirt, and a nice pair of slacks. Walked in, every other speaker that was on the stage was wearing a suit and tie. I ran back to my hotel room and put my suit on. So pray for me to figure things out a little bit better when it comes to the dress code. I'm really glad to be with you as men. And one reason I want to stand is, is because I know myself. I'm a, I'm a night owl. I went to bed. I go to bed usually at four or five in the morning. Sometimes work all night, and I, I've got to stand to get my blood circulating this early in the morning. And I'm glad to be able to be here with you to study God's word. Thank you for your presence here today. Learning to lead, and learning to lead like Abraham. The very first verse of the New Testament introduces us to Abraham in the New Testament, of course. This is why knowing the Old Testament is still an important part of being a child of God. I know that you know that we're not under the Old Testament. In fact, uh, the Bible says it was taken out of the way, that covenant was, according to Hebrews 8, 6. And yet, I think there are some people sometimes that have taken that truth too far. Uh, one of our graduates actually told me that in a church where he was preaching, uh, one of the elders told him never to speak any more sermons from the Old Testament because we're not under it. And so he wasn't even allowed to reference it as a text. I said, well, start in Matthew 1.1, and when you get to the name Abraham, say, I'd like to tell you who this is, but I'm not allowed to. Not <laughs> Obviously, I wouldn't really expect for him to do that, but a lot of people don't understand. You can't make heads or tails out of the New Testament without a working knowledge of the Old. Amen. It was written for our learning. Who wrote that? Paul told New Testament Christians at Rome that the Old Testament has value. It was written for our learning, not for our law. So when we get to the New Testament and we see the very first verse mentions Abraham, and then the next verse says that Abraham begat, Isaac, Isaac begat. Then we go to Hebrews 11. This is that Hall of Faith chapter. And you'll notice that Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 makes it crystal clear that by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obey, he went out not knowing where he was going. And then later in this same chapter, he gets mentioned again in verse 17. Now, there are some individuals that make the Hall of Faith once, and that's impressive. Abraham makes the Hall of Faith twice by mention at least. In fact, there are more verses describing him in this Hall of Faith chapter and describing him and his relationship with his wife and his son Isaac and God than any other individual in the entire Hebrews 11 chapter. You know, he's mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, Abraham is. And very remarkably, if we were to get to a Jew who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in a room, and get a Muslim who doesn't honor Jesus Christ as the Son of God in a room, and get a Christian who does honor Jesus Christ as the Son of God in a room, would the Christian, the Jew, and the Muslim have any common affection for Abraham? Yes. The answer is yes. There is a origin of faith that just about those three religions point to Abraham in many ways, in the same way as being a very prominent part of their religious persuasion. And so this man is, is no ordinary man, but what can we learn about leading as we journey with Abraham? What jumps off the page at us as we go through his life when it comes to leading? And I really do appreciate this assignment. You know, I always love teaching about Nehemiah as a leader. I love teaching about Moses as a leader. I've never been asked to teach about Abraham as a leader. I mean, certainly as a man of faith, yes, but as a leader. And so this made me go back to the text and just start looking for some things that are always there, that have always been there. But I, wanted, I wrote down 20 things 
and I know I'm not going to get to all of them in this first session. I'm only going to take about 30 minutes of first session. We'll, from my understanding, we'll break and then we'll we'll come back and finish things out. But I, I'm going to give some attention to some of these more than others. But uh, number one, here's the number one thing that I want to point out. Good leaders are good followers. You can't be a good leader without being a good follower. But a follower of whom? Well, go back to that text in Hebrews 11 and verse 8 and notice that Abraham is called to follow. Not to lead at the first, but to follow a leader. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going or whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob that were heirs with him of the same promise. He was looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so this man, Abraham, is called to follow God where God leads him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go on a trip, I kind of like to know where I'm headed and what the uh, destination involves and how to get there. And it's planned out, it's mapped out. When I came here the other day, I already knew the time of the flight's departure. I knew where I was supposed to land, how long I was supposed to be there. I knew the next flight, what it was going to be. I knew where my car rental was going to be. I had it all planned. I just didn't get in the car and start driving or go to the airport and say, well, whatever gate will do. I knew exactly where I was going. Imagine being told by God, you're not going to know exactly where you're going but I want you to follow me. Now, a good leader knows how to follow the absolute leader. The ultimate leader is Almighty God, and he is the one in charge. Now, we have some elders here, shepherds. You remember 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4 talks about a chief shepherd. Who is the chief shepherd? Jesus, Jesus Christ, isn't it? So, do shepherds, as leaders in the Lord's church, need to know how to follow a leader? They need to know how to follow the leader, Jesus Christ, their chief shepherd. And as you think about it, uh, sometimes people will say, well, you know, uh, what if someone tries to do this in the church and bring in an unlawful way to worship? What if someone tries to do this? Uh, are the elders going to be, look, elders are not you know, just ruling over us as Hebrews 13, 17 does use that terminology. But elders as shepherds over the flock have a chief shepherd that's guiding them in the way that they ought to go. And that is exactly what we see Abraham setting a pattern for us. Follow God wherever he leads and follow his directions. Don't uh, try to change the course. Now, that's one of the things that's interesting about Abraham. When he was first known as Abram, if you'll go back in the text now in Genesis, I want to show you a couple of things that uh, stand out as we think about this, this Abram. In Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, the very end of that chapter, around verse number uh, 24, 25, it mentions a man of the name of Nahor who lived after he begat Terah, 119 years, begat sons and daughters. Then we hear about verse 26, Terah. He lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. We learn more about them in verse 29. Abram and Nahor took wives. Who was the wife that Abram took? Sarah. Sarah. And then you'll notice verse 30. Sarai was barren, she had no child, and that becomes significant in his journey. Terah took Abram his son, Lot the son of Aaron his son's son, and Sarai's daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, they went forth with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They ended up going to Haran, which was 600 miles from the Ur of the Chaldees, 600 miles. And so they get there, and they seem to stay there for a while. 
And then chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I'm going to make of you a great nation, bless you, make your name great, you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, curse him that curses you. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. When God says go, you what? As a follower, you follow the leader. And what does God tell Abram to do? Go. And what does verse 4 say Abram did? He departed. So he departed. As the Lord had spoken unto him. Do you know how to follow directions, Abram? Yes. Good leaders know how to follow God's directions. And this man, Abram, is following directions. How old is he at the time that he leaves Haran? He's 75 years old. And so we notice that Abram is following. Now, let me make this subpoint. Sometimes you have to follow the leader into a different place than your parents have led you. And this is the case with Abram. If you'll go to Joshua 24, what was Abram's background? In Joshua chapter 24, in verse 1, it mentions that Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel there to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, their judges, their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And then watch what Joshua says here in verse 2. Joshua 24, 2. He said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelled on the other side of the flood in old time, even who? Tyre, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they did what? They served other gods. Abram grew up in a culture of idolatry. As a matter of fact, the moon god, sin, S -I, it's spelled like the word sin, but it's a different uh, kind of usage of those letters. The moon god, sin, was the God that was probably the most reverenced God of his culture. And so God calls Abram away from family religion to embrace him as the one true God. And verse 3, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and notice the next word, led him. Good leaders are led. They're led by God. Led him throughout all the land of Canaan, multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. And so the first point that I want to make today is that good leaders are good followers. And they follow the right one. They follow him wherever he leads, even if it is in a different direction than they have been led to go in the past by people they love. And so good leaders have to be willing to stand up against family if God's directions lead us in that way. So, one other observation about his willingness to follow. This was a permanent commitment Abram's making because look at verse 5 of Genesis 12 and see something that really does kind of jump off the page when I read it. Abram took Sarai, his wife, this is Genesis 12, 5. And Lot, his brother's son. And what's, what's the next phrase tell you about how much he took with him? Oh. And all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls they had gotten in Herod, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, Abram's 75 years old, and I know he lived to be 175, so he's not yet to middle age yet for him but nevertheless let me ask you a question some of you have lived where you've lived for i would guess some of you a number of years right some of you probably been in the house where you are for a number of years and if someone if the lord spoke to you today obviously i'm speaking hypothetically here if the lord spoke to you today and said i want you to gather everything up and and move, and I'm not going to tell you exactly where you're going, just follow my lead. Would you find that uh, difficult to, to do mentally and emotionally, at least in some ways, to uproot everything? I, 
I'm, I'm settled here, Lord. This is, this is where I'm, this is my home. I'm settled here. So lead, following the leader sometimes is a little unsettling, isn't it? But you, that's where faith comes in, isn't it? Abraham, what does Hebrews 11 8 say? By faith Abraham obeyed and went out not knowing where he was going. He had to trust the GPS of God. Our GPS can lead us astray, correct? Uh, you trust these things. I remember years ago I was at a gospel meeting in Kentucky. And Saturday night before the meeting, I got that GPS out. And I punched in the address of the church building. And just for good measure... I got online and went to Rand McNally's website, got the directions from there, printed off, and then for good measure, I also went to MapQuest and one other. They all said the same exact thing about how to get to that church building. So how much confidence do you think I had the next day? I quadruple checked this. So I leave the hotel parking lot, I'm headed for the church building, and I hear the voice say, you've reached your destination. I said, well, there's a club of trees. There's nothing else besides trees around. What do you mean I've reached my destination? Is the church building back in the woods? Do I have to get out of the car and traverse back there and hope I run into the building? I was not smart enough to bring the phone number of the brother that I've been in contact with about this meeting. And so I'm literally driving around looking in vain for anything that looks like a church building. And finally my phone rings. Will Clark, yes. Are you okay? No, I'm lost. He says, well, where are you? And I just at that moment he asked me, driven by a sign that said such and such state park. And there was silence on the other end of the phone. And he said, Brother Clark, you're 35 miles from us. <laughs> 35 miles? Well, when you go seven, when your directions say turn left and go 17 miles, and you're supposed to go right and turn 17 miles, <laughs> then you've got to drive the 17 back to get where you were, and then go the 17 you should have gone. Yeah, I was 30, almost 35 miles away. He said, we'll just sing till you get here. I said, okay. Very embarrassing. I was relying on a GPS that was, and I don't for one moment think the people at MapQuest and Rand McNally and TomTom Tom and these other directional sites got together in a room and said, let's get B.J. Clark. Let's give him a bad day. No, I, I know that's all just the way it turned out. I did I sincerely believe I was following good directions? I didn't get in the car that morning thinking I was following bad ones. So can you and I, if we're not careful, think we're following good directions only to discover, whoa, well, I'm on the wrong road. I need to get on the right road. Abram, to his credit, was willing to go down the road and follow God at the beginning. So here's number two, and i got to pick up the pace here a little bit. Number two, good leaders lead their families. Good leaders lead their families. You'll note in verse 5, it's not just the property that Abram's taken with him. He took Sarai, his wife, Genesis 12, 5. Lot, his brother's son, his nephew. All their substance, but notice, and the souls they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth. To go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And when you get to Genesis 18, you'll notice God makes a statement about Abram that I would want him to be able to make about me as a father. God, what do you know about this man Abram? I tell you, by this time, of course, he's called Abraham in Genesis 18. What do you know about Abraham, God? Watch what he says, verse 19. I know him. What do you know about him? He will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he's spoken of him. I know he's going to do his part to command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord. I know that about him. Now, may I make a quick point here that... Uh, 
I don't think it's made sometimes. Can a father do his dead level best to lead his children in the way that they should go, just like God led Adam and Eve in the way they should go, and have those children make a free moral decision, just like Adam and Eve made a free moral decision to, to walk contrary to what they've been taught? Let's think about this. Did God teach Adam and Eve the right things? No one would say he didn't. Did he train them in the way they should go? Yes. I think we have unwittingly turned Proverbs 22, 6 into a once saved, always saved passage. And that's never what it was intended to be. It does not mean that any parent that uh, points their child in the right direction is going to hit the target every time. And I've heard an illustration used by preachers I love and respect that frankly I think needs to be reevaluated. Children are like arrows, and if we just point them at the target and let them fly, if we aim them in the right direction, they'll hit the target every time. What's wrong with that illustration? An arrow does not have free moral agency, does it? If you aim an arrow at a target, does it have the ability in mid-flight to say, no, I'm not going to that? I'm going over here. Can an arrow do that? No. Can a human being aim in a certain direction, make a decision to go in a different direction than they've been aimed? Adam and Eve were aimed in the right direction. And what did they end up doing? Use their free moral agency to go contrary to what they've been taught. That doesn't mean our children will necessarily do that or that Abraham's children would necessarily do that, but it's possible for someone to do the right things and to be led, leading in the right way, only to have someone decide, no, I'm not going that way. That's why Proverbs 4 says, children, you hold fast to what you've learned and do not depart from it. Yes, sir. Shoot that arrow. That's right. There, there are all kinds of conditions that can alter the, the thing that you aim. And, you know, uh, I don't have time to go into that, but I really believe that sometimes we have unwittingly, unintentionally beats godly parents over the head with the idea that if a child ever goes astray, it is definitely, automatically your fault. There's no doubt about it. Well, can it be the fault of the parent? Yeah. Absolutely so. And do parents need to evaluate themselves and see whether they, yes. But let me ask you this question. In the parable of the prodigal son, who does the father represent in that parable? We've always said this. Who's the father in that parable? God. Does God have any unfaithful children? Do you know what he said to the people in Isaiah 1 2? I've nourished and brought up children, and they weren't. They rebelled against me. Well, did, you didn't do a good job. No. Wow. Don't say that. And then you, someone says, and this is sometimes true, you see a child that's well, not acting right. So, well, that child's just never been disciplined. Sometimes that's true. Is it always the case? Listen to Jeremiah 2 in verse 30. This is what God says. In vain have I smitten my children... But they received no correction. Did God give them the discipline needed? Yes, they didn't receive it. Be that as the only reason I bring that up here is I don't want anyone to read Genesis 18, 19 and think this is a 100% guarantee that if you command your children to follow the way of the Lord, they'll do it every single time without exception. But I'll tell you this, if you and I don't command our children to keep the way of the Lord, then it's not going to be shocking or surprising that they don't keep the way of the Lord. So that's the second thing. Let me hurry on to the third. God's leaders put worship first. Good leaders put worship first. It's well known to Bible students that when you study the life of Abram, 
you're studying the erection of altars from one place to the next. Now that he's left the idolatry of his parents, his, his family, he is constantly building altars to worship God. Notice in Genesis chapter 12, in verse number 6, Abram passed through the land and came to Shechem, and uh, the Canaanite was then in the land. By the way, this is 400 miles from Haran. This man's putting on some frequent miles for sure. And it's, it's not a quick flight for him. It's not, oh, an air-conditioned ride in a nice, comfortable automobile with good suspension. This man is traveling in times that were not easy to travel. So he's, verse 7, the Lord appears to Abram and says, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And what does he do there on that occasion? There builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And every time you read about Abram going to a new place, one of the first things you see him doing when it's recorded is building an altar. So what does this tell us? Good leaders worship, and they put worship first. Number next, this would be number four if you're counting. Number four, good leaders aren't always good. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you. Can a man be a good man, a good leader in general, and still have moments he's not proud of? Yes. What's Genesis 12 tell us in verse number 10? Genesis chapter 12, well, verses 9 and 10. Notice here, Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now the south, for Bible geography students, is the Negev. It's arid, it's dry. Beersheba was actually located, would be located ultimately down there in that south. But notice Abram doesn't stop there. He goes further south. There was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. That's 225 miles from where he'd been. So let's ask this question. Where did God say, Abram, I want you to go down into Egypt? There's no record of God instructing him to go to Egypt. Why would he go to Egypt? There's a famine in the land. And so what does Abram apparently conclude? There's nothing here. There's nothing, no way I can survive here. And so I need to go to Egypt. Was going to Egypt a bad decision for him? When it comes to what happened next, you remember verse 11, it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, he said unto Sarai, his wife, now behold, you're a beautiful woman, and you're a fair woman to look upon. Now, what woman, woman doesn't like to hear that? But he didn't stop there. He said, uh, therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians will see, when they see you, they're going to say, wow, that's that's his wife, and they'll kill me so they can have you. They'll keep you alive, but they're going to kill me. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell people, verse 13, I'm, I'm praying to you, I petition you, you tell them you're my sister. Now, by the way, technically she is a half-sister. Go to Genesis 20 and verse 12 and notice something that would happened or be given to us by way of information a little later on. Genesis 20 and verse 12. This time Abraham is explaining to Abimelech. This is another occasion when he's going to tell a lie. He says, oh yeah, she is indeed my sister because she's the daughter of my father. We have the same father, but not the daughter of my mother. So we have the same father, but not the same mother. So she's my half-sister. So technically, I'm not lying. But uh, sh this should tell some of us, by the way, those of us who think you can tell a half-truth and it'll be okay. What does this passage show us? What do these two verses tell us? We need to tell the whole truth. And here in Genesis chapter 12, you'll see there in verse number 14, that came to pass when Abram was coming to Egypt. Sure enough. 
The Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Oh, yes, have you seen her? The princes also of Pharaoh saw her. And they, Pharaoh, we've got the perfect new woman for your harem. They took her into Pharaoh's house. He entreated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, the donkeys, men servants, maid servants, etc., camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, his, Abram's wife. Now here's what you and I need to remember. Why is God so concerned about preserving Sarah from not having, Sarai from not having a child, an Egyptian child, the seed line, right? Has God made a promise that through Abram's seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed? If this woman has an Egyptian child and remains in Pharaoh's harem and Abram is killed, what does that do to the seed promise? If Abram's put to death and she's having Egyptian children, there goes the seed promise. So God sees to it that uh, Pharaoh's house is plagued. And Pharaoh calls Abram in verse 18 and says, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So I might have taken her to meet a wife. Now therefore, behold your wife. You take her and get out. Go thy way. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. It's basically, you make sure he and his wife leave. Sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So here's a case where we see a good leader not acting so good. So, does God write off good men who stumble and fall and transgress? Does God write them off immediately and say, I can't use you anymore, period, end of story? Is that what happens? No. No. There's something still here that can be seen from, look at Genesis 20, years later, many years later, but we see that actually this is a pattern in Abram's life because in Genesis chapter 20, you'll notice that Abraham journeys uh, into uh, the place there between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. That's 40 miles from Hebron, where Abram spent a lot of his time. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, uh, she's my sister. And Abimelech, who was the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, you're dead. Wow. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? You have a dream, God said, oh, by the way, you're dead. You're dead, man. The woman you've taken, she's someone else's wife. She's a man's wife. Abimelech had not fortunately come near her. There was no sexual activity involved. He said, Lord, will you, will you slay also a righteous nation? Did he not say to me, she's my sister? And she even, she herself said, well, yeah, he is my brother. So she was in on it too. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. God says, yeah, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore, I didn't allow you to touch her. God then providentially arranged that uh, she would not be involved in a relationship with him. But watch verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. And this is an interesting thing to say at this point in time. The man's already proven he's not truthful. But what does God call him? First time the word is used in the entire Bible, by the way. He's what? He's a prophet. The word literally means a spokesman for God. He's a prophet. He shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if you restore her no, not, know that you and you'll die, you and all that are with you. So Abimelech takes care of this, calls Abraham, says in verse 9, What have you done to me? What have I offended thee that you would bring on me and my great kingdom, or my kingdom rather, a great sin? You've done deeds to me that ought not to be done. You've not treated me as you ought to have treated me. Isn't it sad when the pagans are acting better than God's followers? Abimelech says, what saw you that you've done this thing? Well, I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. 
and they'll slay me for my wife's sake. She is my sister, he explains how. And it came to pass, verse 13, this is interesting. When God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is thy kindness that you'll show to me. How many places did they plan on doing this? Verse 13. What does he say? How many places did they plan on doing this? What? Every place. Every place you say, he's my brother. So on these occasions, Abraham shows us that you can be a good man, but not always necessarily acting as you ought. And when you mess up, fess up. Fess up and do better. Here's number five. Good leaders use their blessings for God. Abram was financially blessed. If you'll note Genesis 13, when he went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, Lot with him, they went back into the Negev, the south. And the Hebrew word that's used there is actually Negev. It's that region geographically that was uh, around Beersheba. Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So, let me ask you a question. Is it wrong, necessarily, to be very rich in whatever the property is? Is it necessarily wrong to be that way? Not necessarily. Do good leaders sometimes need resources to be able to show and lead. Now, good leaders may not be personally rich, but a congregation which they lead may be materially blessed. Should we use those blessings for God and not just hoard them mm -hmm. for our own comfort? They, they're to be used for God. Now, Abram's spirit rich. He could have said, look, I've got it made. I'm just going to settle down. I'm, I'm done traveling. My traveling days are over. Now watch him. He's about to go 225 miles to Bethel. There in verse number 3, he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, house of God, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. And look at verse 4, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there, what did Abram do? Good leaders call on God. They worship him, they call on him, they look to him for their blessings. Now Lot happens to be with him. That brings us to number six. Good leaders seek peace. Good leaders seek peace. They don't like strife if they can help it. But sometimes it's unavoidable when they have to stand up for what's right, but they don't seek it. Watch Lot. Lot is also materially blessed. He's Abram's nephew. And he has flocks, verse 5. He has herds and tents. The land's not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they couldn't dwell together. And note here, there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Abram says to Lot, he sees the friction that exists between the two groups. And he says, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen, thy herdmen. We're brethren. We be brethren. Let me ask you, and I'm not talking about being guilty of doctrinal compromise on matters that matter. We can't compromise on matters of truth. But let me ask you. Do sometimes brethren get into fusses over matters that aren't matters of matter? And do those divisions hurt the church? Yes or no? Strife. No one who's a good leader wants to be trafficking in strife. And here we see Abram seeing the situation. And he says, uh, let, let there be no strife. We're brethren. We can work this out. I remember some years ago, I was in the car with my wife next to me, my children in the back seat, headed to my wife's mother's funeral. There was a brother in the Lord's Church in Texas that was 
trying to make a matter that did not matter a matter that was a big deal and it was not a salvation issue in any way, shape, or form. And frankly, it was more of a personal pettiness on the part of individuals that some guys were rallying around rather than anything doctrinal. So he calls me to bellyache about something and he says, is this a good time to talk to you? And I said, really, it's, it's not. Uh, my wife's mother passed away and we're headed to her funeral right now. My wife's in the front seat, my children here with me as well. So no, it's not a good time. He said, I'm really sorry to hear that about your wife's mother. Anyway, the reason I called is, and then he proceeded to <laughs> unload. And I'm trying to talk to him without saying too much for my children's ears to hear, you know what I mean? And when I hung up and told him, look, this is not a good time. I, I tried to tell you in a nice way, this is not a good time. Why, why won't you accept that? I got off the phone, and I'll never forget my daughter in the back seat said, Daddy, why can't you all just get in a room somewhere and open up a Bible and get this worked out? That would be nice, wouldn't it? Sometimes. Yeah. That would be nice. And sometimes that's what we need to strive for is, is to just come, find a way to come together. Now, what keeps people from doing that? I've got to have it my way. I'm not willing to yield an inch. Is that Abram? I want to start closing out this first session by noticing that good leaders seek peace oftentimes by being willing in matters that you can't, you can't yield on matters that matter. Okay, clear about that. But in this case, this was something that Abraham could yield regarding. Watch what he does. He said, look, isn't the whole land before you? I tell you what, separate yourself, I pray thee, from me. And if you want the land that's to the left, then what does he tell Lot to do? Take that. If you want the land to the right, then take that and I'll take what's on the left. So he basically said, you choose self-denial, saying, I'll deny self and let you be the, the one that chooses. And if it's, uh, look, I know of a church, this is years ago, they were growing so much. They were growing so much, they had to add some parking to the property. But there was this huge tree in the area where they needed to park. And they were going to cut it down and pave there, but then some of the members said, no, you're not. That's where my father proposed to my mother. That's where my grandfather etched his initials in that tree with my mother, my grandmother. And that's where we had this and family photos were taken, et cetera, et cetera. And so that they just completely, completely divided the church over that issue. And interestingly enough, the ones who wanted the tree left there, left and started another congregation, leaving the tree behind, which I never really understood if it was all that important to them. Why would you leave it? But they got their feelings hurt and people started getting in a fuss and now you've got this big issue. You know what I, I'm thinking in my mind? Leave the tree in the middle of the parking lot and pave around it, right? <laughs> Why not do that? But the church literally split over that. So I mean, a matter like that, you have to be willing to do a little giving and taking, right? And so here they... See, Abram says, Abram says, Lot, you, you choose. Now, in this, we see faith, because what is Abram trusting God to do, to provide? He says, you choose. So Lot, he doesn't hesitate, apparently. He lifts up his eyes. At this time, before Sodom and Gomorrah fell, all the plain of Jordan, in that Jordan Rift Valley, at that time, it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, Moses, by inspiration, compares it to what place that it had existed early on? Like the Garden of the Lord. 
Eve, like the land of Egypt when you come to Zoar, if you look at, on Google Earth and a satellite picture of Egypt, you'll see up here the Mediterranean right as you start entering toward it, this huge lush vegetation in the delta region there of the Nile River. And so it was very lush. And Lot says, that's for me. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. Verse 12, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent toward Sodom. Well, I found the most aesthetic place on earth. It's my place. But, but, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and you look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. All the land which you see to thee will I give it to thy seed forever. I'm going to make your seed like the dust of the earth, and you will rise and walk through the land. Verse 17, I will give it unto thee. Good leaders trust in God to give the needed blessings rather than insist on having their own willful way to this detriment of of the brethren. And then notice in verse 18, Abram removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is uh, in Hebron, and built there an altar to the Lord. This is 35 miles from Bethel, so he's once again on the road. And what's he doing when he gets to a place? Building an altar. It's time to worship. Well, this perhaps is a good place to uh, take a brief break, and then when we come back, we can pick up some speed and cover some things that uh, are still left here in Abraham's life that teach us how to lead. And I want to save some time at the end uh, for all of us to uh, chime in on things that have jumped out to us as we've engaged in our study. So uh, maybe this is a good time for us to, to take our own. I know you the preacher's count. There's also the preacher's clock. I think I probably went more than 30 minutes last time, but I uh, I wasn't uh, trying to, I think I just ended up doing that, but uh, I do want to get right into what we have left because uh, there's still a whole lot left in Abram's life or Abraham's life as he's about to be that can uh, instruct us in matters pertaining to leadership and that's the next one on the list, good leaders sometimes have to fight. Now, you say, wait a minute, you said good leaders seek peace, and they do. But the next chapter shows us that good leaders sometimes have to also fight for what's right. And let me illustrate this to you. As you go into Genesis 14, we're introduced to an individual named Keterlaim, who is the king of Elam, and then notice verse 2, these... Uh, made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah. All these different people are mentioned there. And verse number four, or verse three says, all of them joined together. Twelve years they served Keterlehmon. And in the thirteenth year they decided no more. We're not serving you anymore, Keterlehmon. We're not going to be under your thumb anymore. So in the fourteenth year, verse five, came Keterlehmon. And the kings that were with him and smote the Raphans and a number of other individuals that lived in that area, the territory. And the verse number 8 tells us, There went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma, the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela. Five kings. They joined battle with them in the vale or the valley of Sidon. With Keterlaomer, the king of Elam, and then his conglomeration of nations. And then you'll notice that uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah ended up fleeing. And they that remained fled to the mountain. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their victuals, and went their way. Well, who lived, who chose Sodom as his place to live? Yeah. So look at verse 12. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son, his nephew, who dwelt in Sodom. They took his goods and they, they left. Now there came one that had escaped and he told Abram the Hebrew. He dwelt there in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. And these were confederate with Abram. He had some others that were 
on his side. Now watch verse 14. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he said, well, I pray that he'll be warmed and filled. I'll pray for him. There's nothing else I can do. Is that what he says? No. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house. And if you wonder how wealthy Abram was, how many servants did he have that were involved in this trip at least? 318. 318. And he pursued this army all the way to Dan, which was way up north. He divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them on the hobo, which is on the left hand side of Damascus. Now, let me make this very clear to all of us. 160 miles away from Hebron is where these things are taking place. He's willing to go and to fight the battle. And then when the battle is finished, as far as rescuing Lot, he then goes 50 more miles to drive this Ketterlamor further away. And the Bible says in verse number 16, he brought back all the goods. Also brought again his brother Lot, which is technically his nephew, his goods, the women also, and the people. And so another one to add to your list. Not only do good leaders fight, good leaders train. They train. Did you see verse 14? When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his what? Trained or instructed servants is one way that's translated. His instructed servants. So let me ask you, what do we as good leaders, whether preachers, elders, deacons, members of the church who care, what do we need to be doing to this younger generation in a wicked world like we're in? Are we to be instructing them how to put on the whole armor of God? Are we to be instructing them to fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, 12? To endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2, 3? And would you look at 1 Timothy 1, 18? What did the Apostle Paul tell Timothy? And so many things in our world today are so polarized. It's true in the political world. It's true in... Are uh, the religious world, sometimes even in our own brotherhood, we don't seem to know how to be both and. It's either or. And it's, there are some things that are either or. Either you are in Christ or you're not in Christ. There's no such thing as being both in Christ and out of Him. But there are some things that really require balance. When you learn to ride a bicycle, what happened if you leaned too far to the left? You'd fall. If you're learning to ride a bicycle and you lean too far to the right, what happens to you? Same thing that happens to you if you lean too far to the left. You fall either way, right? I don't want to be leaning too far to the right. I don't want to be leaning too far to the left. I want balance. I want to find it in God's Word. The same Paul that opens up his book to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, by focusing verse 2 on grace Mercy and what? Peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord is the same Paul who tells Timothy, you, I, the very reason I left you in Ephesus is that you would charge some there that they would. 1 Timothy 1 3, what's he telling in the last part of that verse? I left you in Ephesus for this reason, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, Paul, are you about grace, mercy, and peace, or are you about doctrinal soundness? This is what I see sometimes in uh, our brotherhood that concerns me. Some brethren think as long as we're doctrinally sound, we don't have to focus much on compassion and grace and mercy and peace. I see some others, they're all about grace and mercy and peace and compassion. <coughs> the doctrine of soundness, that's, 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 that's not good to talk about. That's narrow-minded. That's bigoted. Paul, which one are you? 
Watch verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who enabled me. Verse 14, Paul, do you receive the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Verse number 15. He says, I obtained mercy. Verse 16. And then notice verse number 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee. What's the last phrase of verse 18? Have an inspired apostle telling Timothy to be prepared to do. To wage a good warfare. So Paul, make up your mind. Are you about grace, mercy, and peace or fighting? Listen, is it possible to be both? Can you be about grace, mercy, and peace and also be about standing up for Jesus and standing up for the truth, the right truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? You can. So Abram was a man of peace. He sought peace in the situation with Lot on a matter that was a matter of opinion. He was able to yield. But is allowing a man to be taken hostage and his family to be taken hostage is that something that doesn't matter? No, that's a matter that matters. And so the same man that sought peace in chapter 13 of Genesis is willing to engage in warfare in chapter 14 of Genesis because good leaders fight and they train men to know how to get the job done. They lead men. Why, why is Paul writing, Timothy, by the way? Let's not forget something. Where did Paul say he left Timothy? I left you at where? Ephesus. Tell me what book it is that Paul wrote that says, fight the good fight of faith. Or that says, not that, that says, uh, put on the whole armor of God. That's the book of what? Ephesians. Where's Timothy? He's in Ephesus. So being in Ephesus involves sometimes fighting the good fight of faith being a good soldier, warring a good warfare, but not leaving out grace, mercy, and peace. I counsel our students sometimes, and whether they do it or not, I can't say, all of them. I counsel them to make sure when they look at their sermon log, have I preached some sermons that are emphasizing joy, joy like we did Sunday morning in the meeting here, uh, grace, mercy, peace. Are those things being emphasized in your sermons? Are you talking about the blessings of Christianity? And if, if so, that's great. But then look at your sermon log and have you dealt with any matter that pertains to fundamentals such as how to be saved, how to worship, how to organize the church, how to fund the church, those kinds of things. Which one of those should we preach? And the answer is both, right? We need both of those. We don't need to just do one or the other. We need to do both. And so Abram teaches us peace in chapter 13, necessary warfare in chapter 14, and necessary training for the battles to come. Listen, you and I, I was talking to someone, I forget who it was exactly, about our grandchildren and our children, the, the, the future they face in this country. I'm sure you have the same concerns I do about that, right? We see the world dismantling right before our very eyes and unraveling off the spool, it seems, morally speaking. And we think, what are our children and grandchildren going to do? All we can do is command them to keep the way of the Lord like Abraham did, and then do our best to try to prepare them to fight the battles that are coming in the future. In the next point I need to get to, good leaders give. This is number nine on my list. Good leaders give. When this battle was over, look at chapter 14, 16. Abram brought back all the goods, again brought, his, brought again his brother Lot, his goods, the women also. The king of Sodom comes out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedalabra. And then Melchizedek, verse 18, the king of Salem, brings forth bread and wine. He's the priest of the Most High God. 
He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hand to the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Now watch him. I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch. I will not take anything that's yours lest you say I may never have rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men that went with me. They can take their portion, but I'm not interested in any of the spoil. Listen, technically, since Abram was the victor, what could he have said about all the stuff they brought back? That's who's. Yes. That's mine. Good leaders don't look for self first. They look to bless others first. And that is what he does here. Good leaders give to others. Notice next, and I've got to go faster than I want to. Good leaders, number 10, go the extra mile. Now, this, if you go to Genesis 14 and look at verse 15, I've already mentioned this, but I didn't give it as a main point. Verse 15, he's already smitten them and pursued them on the holo, which is, by the way, way up north near Damascus, to the left-hand side of Damascus. So even though he conquered them, he's driving them further away so that they can't do any further damage. He's going the extra mile to offer an extra uh, protection, a, sheet, a zone of protection for the people. He could have said, the battle's already won, I'm done. No, he says there's more to do to try to make sure this doesn't happen again in the future. So good leaders go the extra mile to prepare for future needs. Number 11. Good leaders show humility. Show me the place in Genesis 14 where Abram is bragging about what he did. Show me the place where Abram is saying, none of these other armies that fought Keterlam are to conquer him. Look what I did, look what I did, look what I did. Where is the self-serving Facebook post from Abram? Where is the look at me, look at me, look at me mentality? Look what I did, look what I did, look what I did. You know what Proverbs 27 2 says? Let another man's mouth praise thee and not thy own. We don't need to be using social media the way I see some people use it. I'm not on social media, but my wife is. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just, I'm not able to keep up. And. Well, she'll read occasionally to me statements. And don't get me wrong, they rehearse all things God had done with them when they came back from a missionary journey. It's not wrong to share good news and talk about your joy of participating in that campaign or whatever the case might be. But when we win a victory, who gets the glory? When they cross the Red Sea, were they high-fiving each other and saying, aren't we amazing? Is that what they were doing? What did Moses and the people do when they crossed the Red Sea? Isn't he amazing? They praised the Lord. They sang to God and glorified Him. So good leaders do not glorify themselves and do not act like they're somebody. In fact, you'll notice Abram's paying tithes to Melchizedek. Why? It's not because... Uh, he is some kind of uh, under some kind of obligation. Good leaders humble themselves and they give to others and honor others. Don't just focus on themselves. Number 12. Good leaders seek divine counsel and not their own. They seek divine counsel and not their own. This really covers a lot of chapter 15 and 16. And so let's summarize this. God we have this little phrase at the beginning of chapter 15, after these things. We don't know how long after, we just know it was after the victory of chapter 14. The Lord comes to Abram in a vision. He says, fear not, Abram. I'm thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. 
Now, for all the victory that he just experienced, what has Abram still got on his mind? He's 75 when he first gets this promise of a son that's going to be his, through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. What's Abram got on his mind as this chapter opens? What does he say in verse 2? Lord, God, he combines both Yahweh and Elohim, the two terms together, Lord, God. Covenant relationship, Yahweh. God, powerful God. Lord God, what will you give me seeing what's, his, what's on his mind? I go childless. Right now, the manager of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Is he going to be the one that I leave everything to when I die? Because the way it's looking, it looks like he's the only one that is going to be around for me to leave an inheritance to, you, verse 3, Behold, you've given me no seed. Lo, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And this is interesting. Does God just level Abram's and say, How could you lack faith in me? What does God know human beings sometimes need? Reassurance. Now, I want you to remember kind of a parallel to this. John the Baptist. When John 1 tells us he saw Jesus coming toward them, what does he say as he sees Jesus coming toward them? He says, Behold, what? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Was John absolutely certain that Jesus was the Lamb of God, the Son of God? In fact, it says in John 1, he bare record that he was the Son of God. Go to Matthew 11 with me for just a moment and notice I, I should have probably added this good leaders sometimes get discouraged. Good leaders sometimes can get discouraged and need reassurance. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. Verse 2, where is John as of Matthew 11? Prison. He's in prison. He's hearing about the works of Christ. So he sends two of his disciples that say to Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Does Jesus say, You go tell John, how dare he lose faith in me? The same one who said, I'm the Lamb of God, is now doubting whether I am or not. But notice Jesus' compassion. Go show John what's the word in verse 4 that comes after that. Go show him what? He's heard what you seen. Go show John again. Those things that you hear and see. What does the word again imply? He's already known this stuff, but he just needs what? He needs some reassurance. Do human beings ever need reassurance? Do, do shepherds in the flock ever need reassurance? Do preachers ever need a little reassurance that, hey, everything's going to be all right? And you go back to Genesis 15. And what does God know that Abram needs? A restatement, a reiteration of the promise. So in Genesis 15, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. By the way, in the original language, in Genesis 15, 4, it's very forceful. It's no, no, no way is Eliezer going to be the the recipient of your inheritance. No, absolutely not. So what does then God do? He that shall come forth out of thine own body will be heir. And then God, it's as if he leads him out. He brought him forth and says, look up, Abram, look up in the sky. What do you see? He sees all these stars. And he said, can you count them? Count the stars. If you're able to number the stars, of course, this was before the days of telescopes and how many stars there are. Certainly much more than we can see with the naked eye. 
So Abram is told, look up at these stars, and so shall thy seed be. And verse 6, he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And then he said this, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Abram says, but Lord, how will I know that I'm going to inherit it? He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you right now. One of the ways they would make a covenant back then is they would take an animal and split it apart into two parts and then have like an, an aisle between the parts of the animal. And this was where you would meet together and form a covenant. And that's exactly what we see happening here in the verses that follow. And a deep sleep falls on Abram in verse 12. And the horror of great darkness is hovering over him. And what does God say in verse 13? Know of a surety. You can know for certain. Thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs. And serve them and afflict them 400 years. But that nation, he says, I'm going to judge. And afterward, they're going to come out with great substance. That's the exodus. And boy, they did come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, you'll be buried in the good old age. But in the fourth generation, they'll come here again. Why am I not going to eliminate the Amorites yet from this land? Because their iniquity is not yet full. Is God a respecter of persons? No, he is not. He let the Amorites stay in the land longer than some probably thought they should have. But God knew what his iniquity meter was and what the exhaustion of his mercy was. And it was the fourth generation when they would finally reach the full point and be judged by God. And then on that same day, verse 17, when the sun went down, it's dark. Smoking furnace, burning lamp passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord did what? Verse 18, made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed have I given this land. And he tells him the dimensions of it and reiterates that. And you think, okay, this is good. Abram is going to be fine from now on. But watch chapter 16. Sarah has other things in mind. She has no children. And she says, uh, do have a handmaid named Hagar. She's an Egyptian. Verse 2. Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing we have no other choice. You go into my maid, Hagar. Maybe I'll obtain children by her. So, good leaders, listen to God. No one else. I, I want to make this, this is an observation. It's not that a wife can never have a good suggestion. Sometimes it's a very good suggestion. And good leaders, if... The suggestion matches up with what God's will is. Can a good leader listen to his wife's suggestion and go with it? Yes. But let me ask you this question. Is it possible for a man to yield his will to his wife's will when he shouldn't? On this occasion, Abram hearkened to whose voice? Sarah. Has he not just heard in the previous chapter the voice of God telling him everything's going to be all right? I'm bringing the child to you. You're going to have this child. And yet, in weakness, he listens to his wife's suggestion. And Sarai, verse 3 of chapter 16, Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, and she, he went into Hagar, Abram did, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, her, she was almost taunt. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. She was absolutely disgusted by this mind. Sarah said to Abram, my wrong be important. She starts blaming him. I've given my maid into your bosom. When she saw that she conceived, she was like trumpeting the fact that she's pregnant and I'm not. I was despised in her eyes, looked down upon as, as, oh, you're the barren one. I'm not, I'm not barren anymore, am I? Is the way Sarah was interpreting this. Now, we're not told exactly.
exactly whether that was the totality of the way Hagar was acting, but I do know this, verse 6, Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your maid, Hagar is in your hand, you do to her as it pleases you. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled. She said, I'd rather be in the wilderness alone than to be another day with you. The angel of the Lord finds Hagar by a fountain of water in the wilderness, verse 7. And she's not our subject, so we'll move on. But I want to notice verse 11. You're with child, the angel of the Lord tells Hagar. You'll bear a son, call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And so she says, God, you see me. In verse 3, and then verse 16 is interesting. How old is Abram at the end of all of this that we just read? How old is he now? 86. So 75 in Genesis 12. He's now, by the time we get to chapter Seven, or chapter 16, 16, he's 86 years old. Does he have the child yet? No. Now get ready to fast forward. We're going to jump 13 years in one little blank space in our Bibles. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty. So wait a minute. 13 years have gone by since chapter 16, yes. Does he have the son yet? The son of promise? No. Good leaders have patience. Good leaders have patience. They have to trust in God to give the blessing and his time. And good leaders must have patience to accept the fact that the seed will do its work, it will come, it will do its work. Now, this strikes me. What is the seed of the kingdom for good leaders today? We're not involved in waiting for a biological son to appear from human seed, but is there any seed that good leaders oversee in the kingdom today? The seed of the kingdom is? The Word, the word of God, right? So sometimes I hear this. Well, we sent out some flyers or sent out house to house, heart to heart, or we sent out something into the community. It didn't do any good. We door knocked, it didn't do any good. Uh, therefore, we're not going to do it again. It's an unnecessary expense because it's not doing any good. If it was bringing forth fruit, we'd do it. But it's not bringing forth fruit. We tried a radio program, no one came, we're not going to do it anymore. We tried God, I've actually heard people say, the day of the gospel meetings over, no one responds anymore, no one comes, so we're just not going to do gospel meetings anymore, etc., etc., etc. Let me ask you a question. Do we give up too soon sometimes on the power of, the, of God to use the seed to accomplish His purposes? We do. Abram gave up too soon on God's ability to bring seed into his life physically. We've got to make sure that we don't give up too soon on the power of the seed to reproduce the church spiritually in our communities. The word still has power. It will still do its work. So good leaders very much are involved in those things. I mean... I am uh, running, you know what I think I'm doing too is I'm teaching through this. I told you they're going to be 20. I'm adding stuff as I go. <laughs> so I have no idea how many we're going to end up with. Some of this stuff didn't occur to me until we're just reading it right here together. And so uh, if, if you're OCD about numbers being exact, I'm really going to disappoint you. I, I know because I'm not sure how many we're going to end up with. We've got just a few more. As we close out uh, chapter 17, I want to make this observation. Good leaders honor the covenant from one generation to the next. 
Good leaders honor God's covenant from one generation to the next. They're not just concerned about doing what we need to do right now. They're concerned about the future generations. And we see that in Genesis 17 with Abram. Watch this. God tells him in verse 10. This, after he told him in verse 9, you keep my covenant. You and verse 9, what does he say? Abram, I don't just want you to keep my covenant. I want who to keep my covenant? And by the way, now, as of verse 5, what has his name been changed to? Abraham. And I'm so grateful for that, by the way. Now I can call him Abraham for the rest of this. Abraham, a father of many nations have I made thee. I'm going to make you exceeding great, fruitful, reiterating the covenant. Now let me ask you a question. Could Abraham at this point have said, look, I heard that six, I heard that 13 years ago. I heard that almost 25 years ago. I'm going to have a son. Really? When? A quarter of a century has gone by. Where is my son? I don't believe. But friends, that's why we looked at Abraham to lead us in faith because he's going to just hang in there, keep hanging in there. And God's going to give him that son and establish that covenant. Now watch verse 10. The law of Moses would say later on that this was the staple of it. But also the patriarchal age here. You'll notice every man child among you, verse 10, shall be circumcised. And for how long is this supposed to go on? Verse 12. He that's eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations. But then notice... This is verse 13, an everlasting covenant. And this is to go on and on and on. I'm going to bless you. And by the way, I'm changing your wife's name too. She's not going to be Sarah anymore. She's going to be Sarah. I'm going to verse 16. Bless her. Give thee a son of her. Yeah, I'll bless her. She's going to be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Shall a child be born unto him that's a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that's ninety years old bear? And then this gets back to that point I was giving a while ago. Good leaders seek divine counsel, not their own. Abraham says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Let him be the son of promise. Trying to substitute his will for God's will. And what does God tell him? Verse 19, about his suggestion that Ishmael just be the one. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son in thee. Thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. So this is not just going to be your generation, Isaac, Jacob, and on and on and on and on, and on until the Messiah comes. Now, he said, I'm not going to leave Ishmael unblessed, verse 20. I blessed him. I'll make him fruitful. I'll multiply him exceedingly. He'll beget princes, yes. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. And about this time next year, Sarah's going to be bringing forth a child. So he quit talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So Abraham takes Ishmael and his son, and all that are born in his house, and what does he do with every single one of them according to verse 23? Circumcise. Circumcises them. How old is Abram when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin? 99. 99. And Ishmael, his son, is how old at this time? 13. 13 years old. That brings us to the next chapter in this chapter 18. Notice good leaders show hospitality. Good leaders know how to show hospitality. Let me ask you, what's one of the qualifications of becoming an elder? That is given in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You remember there in the qualifications that are listed, 1 Timothy 3, it says, uh, verse 2, a bishop then must be, he must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, Sober of good behavior, given to hospitality. Good leaders know how to show hospitality. Abram, 
Abraham now, do you know how to show hospitality? Little does he know who he's showing hospitality to. In chapter 18, the Lord's going to appear him unto him in the plains there. And it's a hot day. Notice that. He sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He's trying to find some shade. But look, here come three men. And he ran to meet them from his tent door. Shows them humility by bowing and in a greeting to them. And he says, uh, My Lord, if, if now I find favor in thy sight, don't pass by. Stay right here. I want to prepare a meal for you. And he says, First thing I want to do is get you a little water, verse 4, so you can wash your feet. You can rest your bones under that tree over there in the shade. I'll fetch a morsel of bread and give you something to comfort your hearts. And they said, Do as you said. So, what does Abram do? What's the word, verse 6? Someone read verse 6 for us, if you will, please. Genesis 18, 6. What does it say about Abraham? So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said it quickly. Make ready three measures of fine meal. Eat it and make haste. He hurried into the tent to make these, this meal for them. What? Someone read verse 7. How, how urgent is this hospitality to Abraham? We saw him hurry into the tent. What's the next verse say? He ran into the herd. He ran to the herd. Fetched the calf tender and good. Uh, he, he's not giving them the worst he's got. He's giving them the best he's got. Gave it to a young man. And what's the last phrase in verse 7 say? He hasted. He hasted to dress it. Then he takes butter and milk and, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. He's not eating. He's like, what, I'm standing here in case you want. Have you ever been to someone's house and you say, why don't you sit down and eat and enjoy this instead of just serving everyone else? This is the kind of servant that Abraham is. Good leaders know how to serve. They know how to serve. And they know how to show hospitality. And he's standing there and then this question must have really jolted them. Where's Sarah, thy wife? Now, these are obviously what to him, strangers to him. How do they know, number one, how do they know his wife's name? And how do they know that it's been changed from Sarai to Sarah? How do they know this? Well, I would love to see his facial expression as he starts trying to process uh, all this. Uh, he said, I was certain, and then watch this in verse 10. I want to go with, they said and he said. Look at verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah thy wife? Uh, she's in the tent. And he said, no longer they said, he said, I will certainly return unto thee, According to the time of life and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Now Sarah hears this in the tent door behind him. Abraham and Sarah are old. Wax, well stricken in age. Sarah's past menopause. It ceased to be with her after the manner of women. Sarah laughs within herself saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? The Lord, now we go from they said and he said to who? Verse 13, the Lord said unto Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child with your mold? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life. Sarah shall have a son. Sarah denied, I didn't laugh. And he said, yes, you did. <laughs> you did laugh. So the men rise up to leave. Now what does a good host do? Hospitable. He walks them to the door. In his case, he's actually going to leave them on their way. And then something very fascinating happens. The Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? All the nations of the earth will be blessed in him, and I know him, and I know what he's going to do. Because, verse 20, the Lord said, The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, their sins very grievous. 
I'm going to go down now. And uh, then he says, I'll know. Watch verse 22. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, how many men show up at the beginning of chapter 18? Three. All right. How many individuals show up in Sodom in chapter 19? One. Two. And they're called what here? Angels. So wait a minute. Where's the third and what is he? Who is he? Says the Lord. Verse number 22 says, But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Two of the men who were angels in the form of men went on into Sodom to take care of business there. Abraham still standing before the Lord. Long before the Word became flesh and became known as Jesus of Nazareth, was there ever a time when we see God appearing in human form in the Bible in the Old Testament. Right here. Here's an example of it. Now, this brings me to the next point. Good leaders petition God with a holy boldness. They petition God with a holy boldness. They know how to pray to God fervently and boldly and yet respectfully. Abraham wants to know, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Verse 23, uh, what if, and I'm summarizing for time's sake here. He says, what if there are uh, 50 righteous within the city? Will you also destroy and not spare the place if there are 50 righteous folks therein? What does God say he will do if there are 50 righteous folks in Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, I will spare all the place for their sakes if I find 50. And by the way, Abraham has a wonderful statement in verse 25 that you and I still use today and that is shall not the judge of all the earth do right I'm not the judge I won't be sitting on the judgment seat you won't be sitting on the judgment seat but we know what the judge said we try to teach what he said ultimately all matters of judgment belong to the judge of all the earth who will do right every time but on this occasion God says I'll spare it for 50 Abraham could have stopped there, but what does he do? He says, uh, I'm just dust and ashes. Notice his humility. God, for me to ask you, the God of the universe, for something is really, well, I'm just dust and ashes. But what if there are five less than 50? What if there are 45? Will you spare it for 45? And God says, I won't destroy it for 45. He says, may I speak yet again? Peradventure there shall be 40 found there. If there are 40, I'll, I'll, I won't destroy it for 40. Notice his respectful nature. Lord, let not, don't be angry. I, I, I want to ask you, what if there are 30? Now what have you noticed? He's no longer going in increments of five. He's what? He's going in tens now. Getting a little bolder. What if there are 30? I will not do it if I find 30 there. Verse 31. Behold, now I've taken upon me to speak to the Lord. I know this is asking a lot, but I, what if there are 20 found there? And he said, I won't destroy it for 20. And he said, oh Lord, don't be angry. I'll speak yet with this once. What if there are just 10 there? I won't destroy it for 10. And the Lord went his way as soon as he quit communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So what am I saying? Can prayer accomplish great things if we're bold enough to ask God for things? Yes, sir. I'll close out with this and then I'll just rattle off the other ones for you. There are just a few left without comment. You can just get them in your notes if you want to do that. I went to a church to hold a meeting. Four years later, they asked me back. And when I got there four years later, they tripled in size. And I said, this is fantastic. What happened? They said, well, here's what happened. We, uh, we had this idea that we would come together on one Sunday a month 
for anyone that wanted purely voluntary, they had a six o'clock service. We come at 515 and for 30 minutes, those who are interested, we pray. Just that's what we do for 30 minutes. We would pray and certain deacons would be assigned pray for this part of our work. Then someone else would get up and pray for their ministry with these folks. And then someone would get up and pray for the missionaries, etc. Someone would pray for their local evangelistic efforts. Arnold, they said this became so popular with some people coming that we started doing it bi-weekly. They said, next thing we knew, there were folks on their own without us legislating it or anything showing up early. It was a purely voluntary thing. If you want to pray for the works of the church, we'll be meeting at 515. This Sunday, we'll pray for 30 minutes, and then we'll have a 15-minute break before 6 o'clock service. They said, when we started doing that, next thing we knew, we were putting legs on those prayers. We were not just praying. We were saying, now we need to go out and act out what we can do. We were inviting more people to church, trying to set up Bible studies more consciously. We were just really pouring our hearts out as a congregation in prayer, specifically saying, God, please bless us with good Christian growth. Please bless the gospel with those that we're studying with. And as we invite people to services, we pray for success. They got very specific, very direct. And they said, God, we want to double the church in size for your glory and your honor. And they said when they doubled it, they went to the next level. They said over a period of the next few years, they just kept growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Let me ask you, is there anything you and I can learn about holy boldness and prayer, asking God specifically for the church to grow? What would happen to the church if every member did that? It's amazing what could happen. As I close out, I would point out the following. Number whatever cares about souls. You remember what Abraham did when he got up? Early in the morning in Genesis chapter 19, verse 27, he looked toward where? Sodom and Gomorrah. Is it, is it going to be the case that they survived? Were there ten righteous in Sodom? What? Why did he get up so early in the morning and look in that direction? He cared about the souls that lived there, including his own family. So, cares about souls. Number next. Good leaders must stay on guard. And that gets back to the chapter 21 through 18 lying again like he did in chapter 12. You can't say, okay, I've conquered that and never have to have my guard up anymore. No, good leaders keep their guard up so they don't lapse back into sin. Number next, they celebrate God's blessings. Chapter 21, 1 through 34 is a celebration of the blessings given by God. Isaac arrives on the scene. And I really regret that I ran out of time to cover chapter 22. Good leaders trust in the Lord to provide. Think about this. I'll just say this. How would you feel? You've waited 25 years to get this boy. 25 years. Now here he is, grown enough to carry wood on his back and grown enough to understand there's something missing from this sacrificial journey we're on. We've got all the things necessary for offering a sacrifice except what? He asked what? Where's the lamb, Father? Imagine knowing that Isaac is the intended sacrifice. Abraham says the Lord will provide. And sure enough, Hebrews 11, 19, you talk about faith. Hebrews 11, 19 said he accounted that God was able to raise from the dead. How many resurrections from the dead do you read about in Genesis 1 through Genesis 21? How many resurrections from the dead do you read about to show that that's possible? So how did Abraham know that God could do something like that? He spelled his God with a capital G. And then I love that statement he makes in verse 14. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will see to it. The Lord will see to it. The ram caught in the thicket by its horns and being sacrificed was just a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God that would uh, be our atoning sacrifice. 
And then finally, the last two, uh, the last one, and that one was trust the Lord provide. And then the last one, trust in God till the end. When you read chapters 23, 24, and 25, you see Abraham burying his wife Sarah. Hey, get this. 112 years of marriage. 112 years of marriage. Wow. We wouldn't mind that, would we? If you find a good wife, you'd love to have that many years. 112 years of marriage. He buries her, purchases the burial site for his family in the future. Good leader's plan for the future. Abraham was old and well stricken in age in chapter 24. The Lord had blessed him in all things. And he spends his dying days trying to find, secure the future. Isaac, you are 37 years old. You don't have a wife yet. You need one. Because if you don't have children, what happens to the seed crops? So, you got to go through Isaac. Isaac in chapter 24 finds a wife. And then in chapter 25, Abraham gives all he has to Isaac in verse 5. And then he dies at 175 years old, a good old age, an old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. And here we are about 4,000 years later. Let me ask you in all kindness, without any insult intended, 4,000 years from today, if the Lord lingers that long, Who's going to be in a church building talking about you by now? 4,000 years ago. Or me. Don't think it's going to happen. This is a great man. Not a perfect man, but a great man of faith. And I'm so thankful for this assignment. Thank you all for letting me study this for my own personal benefit. And I apologize for going about eight minutes over.